Hello everybody, I'm Mike Connell, founder of Boston Making a Difference, here with another episode of Be Mad Spotlight. And I am excited and thrilled to say we have with us today a Boston TV legend. She is a multiple Emmy Award winning TV reporter, member of the Massachusetts Broadcast Hall of Fame, and now president of the Boston Theater Critics Association. I am super excited to say welcome to Be Mad Spotlight, Joyce Kilhaywick. I'm excited to be here, Mike, and you are the most patient man on earth. Mike pursued this for uh, 25 years, this interview, and he finally got it today. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce, I'm a, I, I am really excited to have you here with us today. Joyce, tell us, what are you doing during these pandemic times? Well, honestly, and, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but my schedule had been so flat out. Uh, even since I left being on TV in a regular way back in 2008, I've been so busy running my website and doing all kinds of things that when the pandemic hit and we couldn't go anywhere and there was no theater and I didn't have to jump in my car every night and get out or rush to a movie, suddenly there was all this found time. So for me, it's been like a year of snow days. I mean, I'm recalibrating, repurposing, doing things that I hadn't done before, and also doing a lot of things that um, that I was doing, like you know, this interview, uh, conducting interviews of my own, hosting a women's leadership conference, but doing it all virtually. So um, I, like everybody else in the business world, have had to uh, really explore new ways of formatting and doing things. And um, I think there are many advantages to it, actually, many advantages. And of course, I say all this with enormous gratitude because I have a roof over my head. I know where my next meal is coming from. I have a family. I have my health. And so I have had the luxury of found time. I know this is not the case for so many people out there. So I'm extremely grateful. For me, this has been really an amazing time for reflection and reinvention, if you will. So tell us, what, what kinds of things are you working on with Joyce's Choices? Well, Joyce's Choices is my website where I still review movies and theater. So there's been no theater in person, but there have been virtual events. Not so many, but some which are terrific. Uh, I have reviewed lots of movies that have been sent to me in the form of links, which then I watch, you know, on my own screen here at home. So I've continued to do that. Outside the website, I'm working on a podcast right now. And I, you know, when I'm ready to launch that, I'll let you know, Mike, but it's about, um, it's, about it's about life and death. How's that? I mean, it's really about mortality and how uh, people in my age group, and I'm 68 years old, are really dealing with um, the finiteness of life. But it's not, um, it's not sad. It's how do we all live with the possibility, not, no, not the possibility, the absolute eventuality of all this coming to an end. So how does one live? And so that's, that's a huge, huge subject and we're, we're figuring out how to do that now. That's one thing. The other thing is I'm brainstorming about a, a book that I've been thinking about for a while and figuring out how to approach that. And both of these subjects actually tie in to my own experience with mortality and my own cancer history, which has been um, a blessing and a curse, shall we say. Okay, well, that leads us into the question about your, you're a three times survivor of cancer. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you're feeling today and, you know, how you got through all these, you know, struggles with your health and, you know, anyone that we can help that you're fond of and that, you know. I have been actually talking about my own cancer experience for about 30, 35 years now, and I'm very happy to share it. I was always very open about my disease uh, for very selfish reasons. I needed the help. I needed input. I didn't want to spend any time and energy into hiding or pretending or, and I never thought of it as a stigma in terms of me. I was, I'm not responsible for getting cancer and it's something that happened to me. It happened completely unexpectedly. 
and uh, there's not a lot of cancer in my family and the particular cancers that I had, which uh, were malignant melanoma when I was 26 years old. And that's the most vicious, aggressive form of skin cancer you could have. Once that's out of the box, once that metastasizes, there's very little one can do about it. But in my case, um, we caught it early and I'm still here. And uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit more. But the next cancer I had was 10 years later, ovarian cancer. And then I had a recurrence of ovarian cancer. And again, this is an exceptionally deadly cancer. It's the most deadly gynecologic cancer there is, usually because it's diagnosed too late. I had all three of these experiences by the age of 36 years old, very, very young in my life. And since then, I've been extraordinarily healthy. So I will tell you that I was misdiagnosed every single time I had that disease. And because I pursued, because I got second opinions and third opinions and challenged my doctors, some of whom told me, oh, you're fine, this will be fine. I knew I wasn't, it didn't feel right to me and I pursued it until we were able to finally correctly diagnose me and I got the treatment I needed, and there were many surgeries and chemotherapy and all the rest of it, uh, that I'm still here. So what I talk about is how we need to be brave in the face of this. We need to confront the enemy. I have never been a shrinking violet when it comes to facing whatever I have to face. You know, I'm half Italian, so it's like, you know, you gotta go for it. You get, and I never give up. And um, I knew that I could live with doing the best that I could. And that if once I did the best I could, if I still didn't survive, so be it. I mean, that's out of my hands. But I don't think I ever could have lived with, oh, if I had only, if I had only. So I really wanted to live, which meant looking the enemy straight in the eye, finding out everything I could, uh, because the truth, Mike, will out. The truth just will out. You can ignore cancer all you want, but if you've got it, it will out. So the sooner you find it, the sooner you deal with it, the sooner you treat it, the better your chances of survival. In fact, early detection is the single biggest prognosticator of how a person will do. So I have a lot more to say about that. I won't say it here, but that's kind of where I'm focusing a lot of my energy now. That's awesome. That's, you know, it's so great to hear uh, that that's great information for people who may be struggling with cancer or have it in their family. And, you know, the, the early detection is really the, the key. So getting that. You and know, these cancers are hard to find. Them. They're hard to find a lot of them. It's not obvious. And a lot of that got canceled because of the pandemic, not being able to get into the hospital and, and see that. So, you know, that's a challenge in itself, but uh, it is a great tip to, you know, be sure to stay ahead of the game, you know? Yeah, you got to be willing to go. So for women, I say, you know, women don't like to challenge their doctors. Uh, but I will tell you that any doctor who is a good doctor, a smart doctor will welcome a challenge, will welcome a second opinion, and will often facilitate that second opinion. But and men, well, men, you can't even get men to go to the doctor. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got to get men through the door, <laughs> first of all. Mm -hmm. But don't be afraid to challenge because, you know, if a doctor makes a mistake, guess who pays the price? Not that doctor, but us. We have to take charge of our lives and take charge of our health because we are the ones responsible for surviving. I mean, we, we pay the price if someone makes that mistake. So you gotta own it. Uh, I, and I wanna be around for 150 years. Uh, in addition to the 150, I've already been around, Mike. So, so. The, the, the world's a better place with Joyce Colhaywick in it. I always say that, it really is. So uh, so tell us, um, you know, what's what's the outlook for for the, the theater and entertainment industry? How do you see that? you know, going over the next year or well, two? 
everything is taking a lot longer than anybody could have possibly imagined a year ago when we were hearing, oh, we may have to shut down and maybe your kids won't be in school. And I remember hearing that thinking, wow, that sounds a little extreme. Let's hope it doesn't get to that point. Well, we've been living that new normal for a year. And honestly, given the rollout of the vaccine, given how, I mean, and, and honestly, that we got the vaccine as quickly as we did is, nothing short of miraculous. The distribution of the vaccine, I didn't realize myself how complicated that would be. And it's taken- that, that, That's a, a massive lot. undertaking, it really is. It's massive. And and it's, they're working on it. I, I trust that they're working on it. And I'm so glad that, you know, <laughs> that we're all trying to do this. But I also never thought about all the mutant strains that we'd be starting to fight. And now there's an additional premium on trying to get everybody vaccinated even sooner to cut this thing off so that it can't mutate and replicate. So all that said, I am not foreseeing us being back in a theater till 2021 at the end or 2022. And that's honestly what I believe. Movie theaters, same deal. You will not find me in a movie theater. I will not be any place until I get that vaccine. And that's how I feel. And I trust the vaccine. And I know a lot of people are hesitant about it. I can't wait to get that vaccine. I just, I just can't wait to get it. But that's what I foresee. So live theater. I mean, think about live theater, Mike. Live theater is a live communal warm body experience, right? It's how do we pack the house get everybody sitting together for a couple of hours at a time in a closed space with warm bodies on the stage. I mean, that's got every strike against it, but that's what live theater is. So a lot of our artists and theater companies are now working on ways to create a virtual experience. And even when we go back, it's not going to be all of a sudden we're going to have a packed house. And so that economic model is very hard for theaters. I mean, you know, in order to make money, which is very difficult for theater. I mean, that's why Broadway ticket prices are so high. But a lot of these small theater companies, it's very hard to make any money unless you sell out the house. So if you're going to have a half sold house, even for a place like the Huntington or the American Repertory Theater, or the Colonial, whatever, the Paramount, it's it's a losing game economically. So people have to figure out how to do this. It's not going to be a one and done. I don't see till 2022. Movie theaters are in better shape because they have ancillary outlets on which to show movies. You can put everything streaming. You can put it video on demand. You can figure out how to make money that way. Shooting movies is something else again, but they're working on that. And they have way deeper pockets, you know, the movie industry and movie studios. So live theater is the most in jeopardy. And of course, with that live concerts, uh, you know, the BSO was trying to figure out how to do this, but almost every theater company, every musical outlet has, uh, every dance company, Boston Ballet, all of them, museums, they, are, they all have online virtual programs. So go to each individual outlet on portal online and you will find countless opportunities to have a virtual experience okay so that's where we are that's it's going to take a long time so be it we will get through this right i agree uh, i'm a i'm a great concert lover and the first time i ever talked to you joyce was walking into steely dan down at uh, uh <laughs> where were we at that, at that time and we talked going in, and the last thing you said was Steely Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I love Steely Dan. Where were we? Where do you remember what venue? It, it, I think it was Great Woods. Walking into uh, I was, Great I was with a buddy of mine, and we saw you and said hi to you, and and you were all excited to go in and watch the concert, and you know give your your report on it afterwards. And my gosh, there were so many great concerts there. I mean, we and we would go live from the grounds in Mansfield. You know, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, I remember talking to Stevie Ray Vaughan there on the lawn. Oh my God, he was so marvelous, and and apparently he stayed up and watched my report on him later and he said hey the last time we talked you said i played like liquid fire and i thought oh wow that's really cool you know yeah. really cool
Yeah, yeah. That I always envied that job. You know, you got to see all these concerts and and report on them. Phenomenal, and, uh, I, phenomenal I, job. And it is a crime that no one's doing that job now. Oh, when I, I lost my job, they disbanded the beat. I was the first hired, the last fired, and no one has picked up that beat because now you know TV stations don't have the budgets they used to have, right. and so they cut out everything they thought of as a frill or non-essential and of course i will tell you that i always thought my portion of the news was the most important part. i i would agree <laughs> i used to practically have to wrestle bob lobel to the ground to get all my time in because he would talk 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 and i love bobby you know we all loved each other yeah well i, I also uh, one time coming out of a rolling stones concert i was with oh. some buddies and you were standing up on top of the van along with the other Channels were side by side by side with the stadium behind you. Yeah. We, we started chanting, Joyce, Joyce, Joyce. Joy. And, and if the look on Dixie Watley's face could kill, I would have been a dead man at that point in time. It interrupted her report. She was so. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm delighted. But I will say that I love Dixie. I love Sarah Edwards. And we were all very um, cordial colleagues. We were competitive. But it was friendly competition. Well, I, I worked with Sarah Edwards for a year plus at Channel 7, and she was great. She was as nice as could be. And Dixie, she's a very talented sculptor and, mm -hmm. you know, just a, just a great group of women. And mm -hmm. all of us were deeply committed to that beat. And none of us ever, uh, and I will, I will take credit for this, uh, when I came in, I really kind of owned that beat. I mean, we created that beat at WBZ. But I always insisted that I would never ask for exclusives when a, when a group would come into town. If, if I enterprised an exclusive interview on my own, obviously I would, I would keep that. But if a group came in, we never made a deal like, if you talk to me, you can't talk to anybody else. Because I always felt like artists needed to have the most exposure they could possibly have. And I was willing to put my format against somebody else's format. Like, you know, you got to decide if you want to hear it from me, you want to hear it from Dixie, you want to hear it from Sarah, but everybody deserved the coverage. We set that tone. I set that tone and pace. We all agreed that that was fair and that's how we did it. You know, that's what I call fair play. Good for you. That's awesome. Well, the last thing I'll ask you is uh, any tips on movies that you've reviewed uh, recently for the audience to check out? Yes, I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, there is a wonderful movie, perhaps, it's certainly one of the best movies of the year, and it's gonna open this Friday, Nomadland with Frances McDormand. It's a beautiful film that uh, the Boston Society of Film Critics, to which I also am a, belong and am a member, uh, gave awards to this past, at the end of this past year. They released that film to us so that we could see, and it will qualify for the Oscars. It's probably going to win the Oscar for Best Picture. That's my guess. It is a beautiful film about a, a woman who, a widow, who um, travels around the country in a van doing gig work and just being free in the, in the landscape and uh, connecting with other people who live the same way. It, the town where she worked collapsed because the industry there collapsed and she has chosen to go out on her own and be a nomad. And uh, it's a beautiful film about life and what's important and what isn't and making connections across all kinds of borders. And um, it's just a beautiful thing. You got to see it. So I'm recommending Nomadland. I'm recommending another film called Sound of Metal. And it's about a heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing. At first, I thought, I'm not interested. It's a beautiful film about how we inhabit ourselves, about how we deal with setbacks. And it puts you actually in the skin of someone who can't hear and what that's like. Uh, and it's so relevant today about how we all need to hear each other better and how we all communicate differently. And this is so crucial, particularly now in these deeply angry and polarized times. So I would offer that. And on television, uh, there's my favorite my favorite binge watch this past year has been The Queen's Gambit, which you probably have heard about. I, I watched that. Um, that was awesome. A female chess uh, guru, 
she's brilliant chess player. And um, it's, it's intriguing. It's uh, beautiful to look at. It is incredibly absorbing the competition of this game and all the personal stuff that she goes through and what it's like to compete in this world where women don't compete, but she competes. Uh, and it's uh, and the clothes are fabulous. <laughs> and the game is amazing about strategy. Uh, yeah, and how she navigates this. It's a real period piece. It's a, it's a brilliant, it's a very smart piece of work. So those are my best suggestions right now. Joyce, thank you so much. Uh, you truly, you know, have been making an impact on people's lives in Boston for a long, long time, and you continue to do so, and we all appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for being here today, and to my audience, thanks for tuning in to uh, Be Mad Spotlight. We'll see you on the next episode. Joyce, thanks again. Thank you so much. You take care, and let's stay in touch. Thank you, Mike Connell. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You got it right. Bye.